What is best practice in supplier-enabled innovation? Well, what's best practice and what is achievable in different sectors and organizations is hard, if not impossible, to accurately define. Even in sectors where SAI practice is deeply embedded, some organizations in respect of specific customer-supply relationships will be able to promote SAI and secure benefits, and yet with other suppliers they'll struggle. A buying organization that is in a relatively powerful position in a relationship with a supplier will have a better chance to impose its will and be able to successfully launch improvement activity with that supplier. It's just a fact that some supply relationships are more easily directed by procurement than others. But specifically in relation to supply-enabled innovation, let me offer some of the practices high-performing companies apply in this domain. Firstly, involving suppliers at the earliest stage of the design process. Where it was once the norm to find the buying company's designers creating final specifications before circulating them to potential suppliers, this was always suboptimal. Project timelines always put the squeeze on suppliers and when those suppliers came back with requests to modify the specification, the reaction from the designers was all too often hostile. The result was that potentially good ideas went begging. Time to evaluate them simply ran out. Suppliers became frustrated and were slow in offering up further ideas to their seemingly uninterested customer. But nowadays, many organizations take a more enlightened approach to collaborating with such suppliers. Companies have got used to the idea that 70% of their cost of sales is in source products and services, and that suppliers have expertise that the buying organization cannot replicate. And using the procurement skills of supplier assessment, risk management, and SRM, companies are bringing pre-selected suppliers into the business to work with those designers and establishing multifunctional, multi-company design teams optimizing designs and removing costs before it's built into the service or product specification. In sectors such as retail, where time to market is a vital component of success, having suppliers collaborate closely and early on with the company's product managers has been a long-standing necessity. So I'd say the practice is pretty widespread now. Secondly, it makes good sense. External suppliers genuinely are experts in their field. And they have access to knowledge and well-conceived ideas born of operating with a variety of customers, sometimes in other business sectors too. And then bringing that diversity of experience and thinking to their innovation challenges. Many of today's largest corporations are fairly young. They haven't been around for very long. And they have high expectations of being taken seriously. And these companies have choices. They are no longer subservient or compliant, and many take an active interest in backing winners from their portfolio of customers. The customers that align with them secure dedicated relationship investments as the supplier sees growth and potentially good returns. Thirdly, being pragmatic. In SRM, we talk about value or supply development and value transformation. In doing so, we are labeling a number of different yet related activities that are led by the customer organization, usually procurement, but not necessarily always. When we're looking for inputs from suppliers that are cheaper and delivered faster, we may be deploying specialist business or process improvement experts as part of our overall procurement effort. Back in my Rolls-Royce days, around 15% of my team's headcount would spend up to four days out of five working at suppliers, studying the supplier's business processes to see where hidden costs lay and where inefficient working practices had resulted in delivery delays, lead times that were too long, or quality had been compromised. They would look for evidence of duplication of effort, bottlenecks, remedial work or rework following errors, scrap or wasted effort, KPIs that weren't showing reliable performance and or the planned improvement. All of these represent potentially wasteful activity leading to an unnecessarily excess cost. In the Rolls-Royce setup, specialists would work with people at the supplier where ideas on how to overcome the supplier's operational shortcomings were encouraged. 
anything that could potentially lead to reduced cost or improved quality or delivery was considered before being prioritized and subjected to further evaluation and then depending on the business impact implemented as quickly as possible. Then there is the notion of paying it forward. Although considerable Rolls-Royce relational power was leveraged to secure supplier cooperation, this could not have been done without a willing supplier leadership who in large part acknowledged the ultimate benefits to the supplier's competitiveness. In effect, we were providing free consultancy with improvements past the Rolls-Royce, but read across benefits enjoyed by the supplier. Although this process-focused innovation wasn't necessarily transformational in nature, the cumulative value improvements that were achieved proved to be dramatic. What we weren't focusing on was on value transformation, the innovation of products. This was mainly because the specifications were nearly non-negotiable. The safety critical environment wasn't conducive to that type of innovation. This is not necessarily a factor in other sectors. Ultimately, we could have been more generous on gain sharing, and this should be a major consideration for procurement who seek to have suppliers spend significant resources in generating improvement for the buying company. It's really important that participating suppliers stay motivated, so taking 100% of the benefits of any improvements is short-sighted. There are a small number of practices that can make all the difference when it comes to embedding SAI. Select the suppliers who have the most innovation potential and get them involved early in your product and service development programs. Make sure that your organization has the capacity to evaluate and process ideas that come from suppliers. Protect your credibility by not over-promising your absorptive capacity. Create some dedicated resources who can bring specialist skills to the task of continuous improvement. And recognize that innovation comes at a cost. Be realistic about how much you and your supplier can do and share the benefits to ensure everyone stays interested in improving.